All right. Well, good afternoon, everybody. I uh, really appreciate all of you joining us today, um, as well as uh, Sherry Cosell uh, from Art South Dakota, who will be sharing quite a bit of great uh, information. And then I know Jim Spears is also on as well after jumping off another call. So really excited to have the whole team here and uh, really excited to have all of you joining us from around the state. Uh, looks like we have a a great varied list of people joining us today and we're really excited to talk through some of the kind of nuts and bolts uh, kind of online fundraising 101. Um, to start with, uh, I'd like to say a quick thank you to a couple of our really key partners who have made this webinar series possible, including the South Dakota Arts Council as well as the Bush Foundation. Uh, their support has been really instrumental in a lot of the activities that Art South Dakota does. Uh, especially as we've all been having to pivot so quickly in all of our activities. F moving forward for the rest of the webinar, what I'd, I'd love to be able to do is to use the chat function for just general communication, saying hello to people, talking to your fellow attendees, and then if at all possible, please try to use this Q&A button to ask questions during the course of the, the session. We'll try to take a couple of question and answer breaks, but then we'll definitely have a lot of Q&A time at the end of the session today. So in general, um, today, I really we're gonna be kind of talking through two components. The first is going to be some of the, the services and tools that we can use for basic online fundraising. Uh, and then the second part will be some, some tactics and strategies and tips and tricks uh, for how to get the best outcomes um, along the way. And so everyone is aware on our website at artsouthdakota.org slash webinars, you can find uh, an archived version of this within about 12 hours, as well as uh, archived versions of past webinars. And we'll have a, I'll show it right here, we'll have a resource guide based on the information that we talk about today, and then updated with any of the questions that you have along the way. Uh, and so you'll be able to get to this Google Doc from that site as well. All right, so as we get started, just a couple of kind of background facts and figures about uh, online fundraising. Um, in, in 2018, online revenue was 8.5% of total fundraising. Um, and so it's still a small percentage, but donors who use more than one channel for giving have double the retention rate. So the more you can catch people where they are giving as they are wanting to share the joy that they're feeling in your organization, the more likely you'll be to capture them uh, for future giving. Um, especially, I think that this is true for first time donors. A lot of us have found that with the, the day of giving campaigns where even if it's um, small donors, typically first time donors, many of them are wanting to give online. Then after that, oftentimes they'll renew through your normal annual fund campaign. Um, but the, the key goals are really to provide the opportunity for people to support your mission however and wherever they interact with you. So whether that's on your website, through your emails, at events, whatever it is, you want to make it so that wherever they are, it's frictionless for them uh, to, to support you. Um, and this is especially important for us all now as, as we're having difficulty getting in front of our constituents and our potential supporters because we've had to put so much of our programming on pause due to the current pandemic. So to start the first section, um, wanted to talk just a little bit about some of the technology and services that are available uh, to you to use. And the first thing that we recommend is to take stock of what you already have. Um, many of us may have the capability to accept uh, online donations, even if we don't know it. Um, and so we might not have to invest in additional services or infrastructure. Um, for example, uh, and I apologize, my dog behind me is apparently in a scratching fit right now, so I'm sorry if it's kind of jingly and loud. Um, uh, but for example, on the website host side of things, uh, many website creator services provide this functionality. Uh, Squarespace is a key example of that. Uh, WordPress does if you use external plugins such as uh, WooForms, Give WordPress. There's a number of services there. 
Um, and as a reminder, all of these are listed out in more detail on that resource guide uh, on Google Docs. Um, but first check with your current web host. Uh, there may be the capability already baked in to your, your platforms. Um, the second one would be a payment processor. So if you use Square, for example, to, to accept credit card payments, um, you may be able to, to accept membership and donations through that. Um, I think I see that Ashley Ragsdale from Brookings uh, is on with us as an attendee. And uh, Brookings is one example. The Brookings Arts Council uh, uses their Square payment processor to, uh, for their memberships. And the nice part for them is then it ties into their full store for their gift shop. So if you give through Square, it automatically sets up the 10% membership discount to their, their store and events that they provide. So it becomes kind of a nice turnkey solution using something they already have. Um, another example there is Eventbrite, which many of us use for, for ticketing information. Um, and that's one that actually I'd like to throw it over to Sherry, my coworker, uh, who is really in charge of that for us to, to talk just a little bit about her experience with Eventbrite and getting people to donate while they're doing something else with you for events. Thanks, Andrew. Yeah, um, Eventbrite is, is our event management platform. And one of the major things that we do for fundraising on there is always have the donation button on their um, payment page. So if you are, I'm going to attend the full state arts conference. Ooh, but I want to be a member. I want to get that member discount. I always have that button right there in their payment processing checkout where they can select donate and a specific amount. Um, we also try to entice them through Facebook, uh, I mean, through Eventbrite with, um, if you are a member of Art South Dakota, you never pay outside processing fees, credit card processing fees, and that's been a huge one. Um, especially, you know, as we're all trying to save money uh, today and as we move forward, uh, that $10 process, payment processing fee can, is huge. And if they make a $20 donation, you can set a, a minimum amount then they re they'll receive that member discount. So that's been uh, very beneficial for us through Eventbrite. But also, like Andrew just said, make sure you've got that donate button on everything you do, um, whether it's your website or Facebook or Eventbrite or um, you know your, any of your social media platforms. Make sure that donate button is right there and easy for them to see. Great, thanks, Sherry. Um... The, um, uh, the third example of some technology and services you might already have is, is if any of you use a donor database or any sort of a, a content uh, contact management system, um, definitely check with them. Uh, for example, with Art South Dakota, uh, we use Bloomerang to track all of our, our donors and our mailing lists, our physical mailing lists, and they have a built-in online uh, giving platform. So that's what we're able to embed into our webpage with a donate button. Um, so the, the summary there is to just take stock of what you already have because it's very possible you may already have this capability. If you don't already have this capability, um, there are many outside services that provide this. This is just a small example of three. Um, may, there's many more that may fit your needs better. Um, but uh, three we wanted to point you to as possibilities today are Give Lively, PayPal, and GoFundMe for Charities. So the first, Give Lively. This is one that uh, Julie Amsbury from uh, the Yankton Area Arts Council uh, suggested. Um, they've had good luck with it. It's a full featured uh, platform. The thing I really like is that essentially it's paid for by, by donations or tips from the people giving to you and then from payment processing fees. There's no fee to nonprofits otherwise. And it has um, a number of, of aspects to the platform, including full fundraising pages, donating buttons uh, to put on your website. But the thing I really like is they also have a text to donate uh, capability, which is really useful at some of your events to be able to say, hey, and if you liked what you saw tonight, text one, two, three to this number to, to give now. So it really helps to have that all integrated into one, one solution and one possibility. Um, the second option is PayPal's online fundraising platform. I know many people have had some 
positives and negatives with PayPal. Um, the one nice thing with the PayPal donate button is it's a pretty simple process. You generate uh, the code and just copy and paste it into your website. Um, either you or your web provider can do that for you. And it's a relatively frictionless process um, for just purely for accepting donations. They don't do anything else fancy, but at least you can get a donate button on your web page quickly and easily. And then the third option um, that we wanted to uh, point you to is GoFundMe for charities. So GoFundMe originally started as a crowdsourcing, uh, crowd fundraising platform for individuals, but they have now expanded specifically for uh, charities and a little bit similar to Give Lively where they have the donate buttons, they have metrics on your giving, um, and then they also have uh, landing pages for different events. One thing they do, which I've not explored at all, is they also have a registration and ticketing component. So if you don't already use something like Eventbrite, this is another option to potentially explore uh, for your events. And then the, let me get back to my slides here. Then the last sort of technology and service that we use quite a bit um, is Facebook. Now, um, a couple of things with Facebook. First and foremost, to be able to accept donations and to, ex to have people start uh, giving campaigns, say for their birthdays for you, you have to be approved as, an, a, as a, a formal nonprofit. Um, and that's another one I'd like to toss over to Sherry because she had some, uh, some great experience having to go through that process for us. You know, it's, it's your typical process of you, you're gonna have to prove to them that you're a 501c3 by providing all your IRS documentation. You're gonna to have to give them your um, director, your executive director's birth date and um, address and a lot of personal information. And um, the other, you'll need the employment EIN identification number for your organization. And then they'll, um, also you'll need to make sure that your, your bank is with a, a licensed financial, financial institution. That's very important too. Um, they check all those things before they let you through. And because um, Art South Dakota is, a, is an advocacy organization and sometimes we do post um, some political things or uh, 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 surveys for um, those running for office, we had to go through another hoop and prove that we were um, a United States organization. And in that case, they mailed you, snail mailed you certain codes that you had to go into Facebook and enter that allows you to um, add that to your nonprofit page on, on Facebook. Um, in doing that, by going through all those hoops, then you are able to add a donate button to your Facebook page. And like I said before, you want that donate button everywhere. Um, no matter where they are within your organization, you want a donate button. So by going through those hoops, being a nonprofit Facebook page, you can add that donate button and now your friends, your board members can host fundraisers for you, which is a very easy way to make money in which we found out throughout Art South Dakota when uh, one of our board members, Brian Bondi, hosted a, a birthday fundraiser for us. And, and it worked out really, really well. Um, not much work goes in on our part. There are some downsides to it that Andrew can talk to you about, but um, the last good thing about that is Facebook doesn't take any fees for, for these monies that are raised. So all the money that is raised goes into your bank account. Um, so to follow up on what Sherry was mentioning, um, two points to keep in mind with Facebook fundraising is, is typically it seems to work quite a bit better if someone else other than the organization itself does the ask. So whether that's a board member, board president, a fellow supporter, um, an artist that has been impacted by your organization, that tends to work quite a bit better than, than the, the director or the volunteer director of your organization um, posting it officially as a uh, Art South Dakota fundraiser. If it's someone else, the ask is much easier because then you're asking your friends to give to something that you care about. Um, and then the only other thing to keep in mind with Facebook is uh, quite often you only get email addresses. Uh, 
from the donors. And so oftentimes then you'll want to follow up, try to get them on your mailing list, see if you can get there at physical address so that you can send them your event mailings and the other activities that you'll be uh, working on. Um, all right. Thank you. So a couple of, of overall points with the technology and services is just know that many of these services uh, will connect to a third party for payment processing. So oftentimes it'll be PayPal uh, or Stripe. And so uh, again, look to see what you may or may not already be using uh, for other payment processing options. Because if you, if you use Stripe with anything else, then you can just connect everything up and everything works together. Um, and then the other thing which, which I'll have Sherry jump in on as well is just always run the pricing options. Many of these are based upon uh, payment processing fees. So it'll typically be a percentage of the payment plus 30 cents or, uh, you know, like PayPal is typically uh, 2.2% 2, um, 2 .2 plus 30 cents per transaction. So you'll want to run a couple of demo pricing options to make sure that you really are getting the best deal and retaining the most money. Um, and then Sherry, you're kind of an expert at making sure to get nonprofit discounts as well. You know, that's one thing that I do with every purchase that we make is the first thing I do is double check with the business, the software company, do you have nonprofit pricing? And a lot of times you're not going to find this on their website. You're going to, you, you might find a form that you have to fill out and go through those same hoops again of providing all your IRS documentation. But what I found is most likely they're not going to have that on their webpage. So you have to reach out to them directly and ask. And many times we found they actually do. And sometimes these are free. Um, in the, our case with our payment processing was Stripe and they offered a certain amount uh, of our fundraising to have no processing fees up to a certain dollar amount. Um, but we always make that ask. It's not always there, but many times it is, no matter what you're looking for in, in uh, in some of the tech out there. Great. Um, so really quickly, I wanted to let you know that in the resource guides, uh, back to the Facebook uh, fundraising, I forgot to mention, I do have direct links to the Facebook for nonprofits help section, which has all that information you'll need on how to qualify for the fundraising tools and use the fundraising tools, uh, as well as a, um, a direct link to how to complete any of the steps that are marked as pending with a link to the sign up page for nonprofits. So I'll pause here for a minute um, and just please feel free to, to type any questions into the Q&A. Uh, we're going to jump ahead to the second section uh, for tactics and strategies, but please feel free to ask any questions and, um, and we'll definitely have some more Q&A time as we go. Andrew, I see a question in the chat there. Yes, can you see that, Sherry? I, I don't have that. Yeah, uh, Melanie Bliss is asking about social security numbers. Um, I'm not sure. I, I'm, I'm assuming you're asking if a social security number will, will qualify instead of a, an EIN. And um, no, I don't think so. You have to have a registered um, EIN number with the IRS. We, I've never had to give any social security numbers out of, for Jim as our executive director when I apply for these nonprofit rates, um, only our EIN or, or TIN. Great. Thanks, Sherry. Thanks for catching that. Yeah. So now for question, Melanie, just let me know. Sorry. Um, so now for some some tactics and strategies, you know, as, as Sherry has mentioned a couple of times, you know, that you really want to make it easy to use, easy to find and everywhere. Um, there was one study that in 2018, 17% of website viewers to nonprofit pages couldn't find the donate button on nonprofit web pages. Um, and the thing to keep in mind there is what's easy for you may not be easy for everybody else. Definitely have other people, constituents, people that are younger than you, older than you, more tech savvy, less tech savvy, try it out. Because typically when we're designing web pages or working with a web page designer, we've looked at it so much that to us, it's really obvious where something would be and how could anyone ever miss this? It's right there. But it might not be as easy to find as you think. So just make sure to, to really ask for as many uh, people's perspectives as possible with that. 
And then really with your website, you're gonna to wanna to make sure to have a lot of, of good information beyond just who you are and what you do because donors will use your site to validate you. First and foremost, they're gonna make sure you're a valid nonprofit. So make sure to display your nonprofit status somewhere on your webpage so that they know that when they're giving, you are a nonprofit, you're up to speed, they will, their gift will be tax deductible. Um, and then they'll also be there to find your events, to look at your services. So make sure that it's just easy for them to give while they're there and excited about the things that you do. Um, and then another just tiny tip in general is to just always make sure any of these sites, these, these services that you're using, check it from a mobile device as well. Um, more and more people are first going to places from their phones, you know, especially now we're, we're sitting on our couches when we can't go out and we're browsing the internet. And so if, if you just make it as simple as possible for people to give, they're more likely to give at that point. So now for actually building up the case for support. Um, so really you can use your same annual fund strategies that you always use to build this case for support. So you're trying to, to, to tell your donors, why us? Why, why should you feel joy in giving to us and why will this excite you because you've been impacted or you've seen the impact of what we do? So typically the kind of formula that a lot of people use there is, is what is the problem? What is your novel solution to that problem? The results of that solution and then why the donor should care you know so if you're teaching summer art classes the problem is that children don't have access to arts education during the summer months and are missing out on this vital creative exercise for themselves so the solution is that you're providing week-long camps for children the results is that you've now had 500 kids come through your program over the last four years and you should care because now our, our children are continuing their education through the summer. They're hitting the fall, uh, much more able to jump back into school with less learning loss and they're just becoming better people in the process. So keep those same messages like you would for your annual fund. That said, Many of us, myself included, uh, come from the era of writing long annual fund letters. Um, and sometimes those can still be effective. Um, but especially with online giving, we, we absolutely have to keep our messages short and targeted as our attention span is even shorter online than in a physically mailed piece. Um, and so Oh, one second here. It looks like my video died. Let me see if I can quick change that. Sorry about this, everybody. One second. Um, Sherry, if you wouldn't mind while I'm getting this back up and running, could you talk just a little bit about how helpful video and photo, uh, as I'm struggling with video, can be uh, for online fundraising? Sherry, I think you're still muted, sorry. Let's talk tech and video problems. Okay, um, the, with photos and videos, what I find is always follow on social media or on your website, your analytics or your insights. Because what you'll find if you're putting photos on there from your events or a video um, montage that you can make easily on Facebook, you don't need to have any special software or do anything fancy. Um, they, they provide you with, with the software that you need to make a video, but our metrics just jump. Our analytics um, from our followers just um, it goes through the roof as opposed to when we don't use anything enticing like a photo from our event or a video that we've created. Um, for example, what I also do with that, um, with photos and videos and following our, our insights on Facebook is I look to see when our followers are up. And uh, for example, I, I looked at it this morning just to check real quick and 200 of our Facebook followers are, are up and looking at Facebook at three in the morning. And then the rest of them are between 6 a.m. and 9 p.m. So what we try to do when we do any fundraising or any tactics like that is make sure we're targeting those during those prime times when our followers are on. And, and, it, and it's, it's good to know what those are in your own um, 
Facebook group or page. Great, thanks, Sherry. Um, and one thing to keep in mind there is obviously the higher quality, the better. But what we've found is even just cell phone videos can be really impactful. Um, you know, for, for us as, a, as Art South Dakota, we did a fundraising campaign for South Dakota Gives last fall in support of the Arts Education Institute. And uh, Jana Bastian, who's one of the, the teachers and attendees, just had a student help her uh, take a quick cell phone video, a testimonial of why it was so impactful for her. And I think that 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 type of intimacy really helps people draw you in. Sometimes an overproduced piece can feel like a commercial and turn people off. So even just a good quality cell phone video can be really effective to catch people's attention. You know, that's a good point, Andrew, that if you don't mind if I just add something that um, I learned at the Arts Marketing Conference was whenever you have an event, interview your attendees. Just have your cell phone real quick and, and do a quick interview that you can use in a video in the future. Um, it helps tell the stories, your story of what's going on. And that's also really important when you're doing those social media platforms. Great. Um, so then an, another component of the case for support is with all of your giving, but especially considering online giving as well, is try to target your donors with, with what a lot of people consider a top-down, inside-out strategy. So top-down, it just helps you prioritize who you're spending your time and energy on. So top-down is start with your largest donors and then work down to your smallest, uh, with the newest people being at the, the bottom. Um, your largest donors already know you. They already like you. They may be willing to give again in support of a special program um, beyond what they've already done because they're already one of your closest allies and partners. And then the other component of that is inside out. So start with the people that are closest connected to your organization and work your way out. So people like your board are going to be the most closely connected to your organization and hopefully understand what you're doing and why you're doing it. And then you go to it to volunteers, to attendees, and then it spreads out to your general mailing list and then to new people that may not know much about you yet. But what that really does is just help you prioritize so that you're catching as much of the attention of the people that know and like you already as you can. And then you're using this to, to get new small donors, to bring them into the family, to create that relationship that you can then follow up on and turn them into annual fund givers and, and more long-term givers. So then the, the last component of the strategies that I'd like to talk about today uh, is some of the basic donor relations. You know, many of you, none of this is going to be big news to you, but just a reminder that especially with online giving, please send the thank yous quickly. Um, typically, the goal is within seven days, um, if not even a little bit faster. Your, the service that is allowing you to accept the donation online should send an automated email to just let them know that the donation was processed. But if you can then send the physical thank you as quickly as possible, I think people are more nervous about where their money went when it's just a digital transaction. If they mail you a check, you still want to be speedy. But people trust that it takes a little bit of time for the mail, takes a little bit of time to then get to the bank and then process the letter. So if you can try to batch that, you know, even if it's just once a week, you make sure to, to batch through any of these, these thank you letters. Um, and then as many of you already do from the thank you letters I've received from you is, is add a handwritten note, if at all possible. You know, even just if you can write a quick thanks and then sign your name, just then people know that this wasn't just a form letter that's, that's been, been dumped out and sent to them, but that someone took the time to get this letter prepared, to thank them for their gift and for supporting the mission that, that you're engaged in. Um, and then one of the last components is to, to really prominently show the thank yous on your webpage. So have your membership list, have your individual and corporate sponsor list there uh, for a couple of reasons. First of all, it's kind of a nice soft peer pressure. When people are validating you, they see, oh, so-and-so has given to this organization. They're a good friend of mine. I probably should too, because then they'll, they'll like me <laughs> even more. You know, it's, it's kind of that good way. And then also they see the, the people in your community that they know and respect trust you with their money and with their philanthropy and their giving. So it helps them trust you as well. Um, and then Sherry, I wanted to, to throw it to you because you do a really good job of just making sure we kind of show the love to all of our 
all of our donors uh, in you know program books on the website and just making sure that that's easily accessible. So, you know, what have you seen with that uh, as you're getting that ready to go? You know, that what you said about peer pressure is right. And, and one of uh, two out of the three times a year in our Arts Alive um, mailing, we prominently display all our members, uh, member organizations, individual donors, and um, some sponsors. And again, that's the neighbor looking up their names. They love to see your name in there, but also they want to know, oh, geez, gosh, Bob Jones, he's a member. Like Andrew said, I should be a member too. And, and it's good, and it's good advocacy. Um, when it's January to March in Pierre, um, we make sure that issue has got all the names in there, and, it, and it's important for our legislators to see. Um, everyone that's supporting us as an organization. And same with you, when you're sending anything out, um, come to our event. It's important for your local legislators and city council members to see all these people that are, that are supporting you and your organization. Great, thanks, Sherry. Um, so there's a couple of good questions that have come up that we'll address, but just to, to quick summarize, you know, I think that in general, the, the online fundraising will be a complement to what you're already doing. You know, some people are having very good luck at, at having their primary fundraising online, but most often you'll have a, a more comprehensive annual fund strategy, uh, a giving strategy soliciting at the events that you run, and then the online giving is just a way to make sure that however people are interacting with you, they're able to give when they feel that, that, that love for you and the activities that you've been doing. Uh, so a couple of questions and clarifications that have come up in the Q&A in the chat, and please uh, feel free to jump in with any more questions that you have. Um, uh, Anne from Watertown, thanks Anne, it's great to have you on the, uh, the, the list today, uh, did mention that it is easy to get an EIN easy, even as an individual. So uh, even if you're doing fundraising for an organization and needing to use yourself as the organization, you don't yet have an EIN, uh, you can get a tax ID number or an or a EIN number um, pretty easily. You don't necessarily have to even be a business or a nonprofit yet. Uh, so you can do that through, um, I believe that's through the IRS webpage. You can just apply to get an EIN. It's pretty painless, uh, an easy uh, application. Um, and then um, uh, Jim asked a great question clarifying on if you have to have a website for these services to work. Um, and that's a great question, Jim. Um, no, you don't. Some of them you do, but many you don't. So any of the full featured services like GoFundMe for charities and Give Lively, any of them that have what they'll often call a hosted page or a landing page, um, they'll host that on their web servers. Now, what you'll lose if you don't have a website is you won't have the ability to direct people easily through uh, a URL like artsouthdakota.org. But if, if primarily you use Facebook to communicate with your patrons, then you can still have outside services beyond Facebook that can integrate in and still be able to accept these donations online. Uh, another example of that is Square. I believe that Square, you are able to set up shop pages essentially through their setup. And so if you have any other services you're selling, same thing with Eventbrite. So any of these full featured services uh, will often allow you to accept donations online even if you don't yet have a website. And then uh, another question came in from Justin. Um, and this is a good question. He asks if, if we recommend listing donors by amount given, uh, such as giving levels. Um, for individuals, we definitely do. I think it doesn't have to be the exact dollar amount, obviously, you know, and you said that in your question of, of giving levels. That'll be different for every organization, but um, it does a couple of things. Then, first of all, your prominent big givers feel that little extra bit of, of, of thank you. You know, they, they see that they're set apart. So the people that give you the top 5% gifts, whether that's for some organizations, that'll be $200 gifts. For some organizations, that'll be $1,000 gifts. Whatever that level is for you, those, you know, two to five top givers really want to see a little extra love. Um, they, they just like to know that they're, 
that they're thanked deeply. We should thank all of our donors. Everyone is a part of the family, but we just want to give them that little extra recognition. Then beyond that, um, I think the, the, the giving levels do two things. It does show uh, donors, hey, a lot of people are given $200. Maybe instead of 100, I should consider 200 because all these other people that I know are in that that 200 to $500 range, for instance. So it gives you an incentive to bump them up to that next level. Um, but then determining what those giving levels are will be based upon your past giving. And that can help with some interesting internal metrics. So um, ideally, and this is totally ideally, but ideally about 20% of your total giving should come from that top level of two to five donors. And then another big chunk in the middle, and then the bottom level fills out the rest. So what this allows you to do is just sort of see, okay, where am I, where are we missing? Do we have a lot of $100 donors and then no one above 200 and no one really below 100? So what are we doing that isn't allowing $25 donors to feel like their gift matters? Or what are we not doing to, to make a compelling enough story uh, to our givers that they really want to, um, uh, that they really want to be able to give at a much higher level. Um, so that's, that's kind of generally speaking industry-wide, that's, that's why giving levels are kind of recommended. Um, that said, we've all seen examples of overkill there. You know, you don't need 15 giving levels and there's one person per level. But if you at least have, you know, two to four to five options, that can really help with people. Um, great. And then another good question. Um, is um, uh, how fast do you typically get your money? Um, so actually, I might turn this over to Sherry um, because Facebook and Eventbrite, every service will be a little bit different. So definitely research that. I know from conversations with Ashley and Brookings that Square is processed nightly. So the nice part there is every night it's dropped into your account. But Sherry, what's been some of your experience with the services that you've used? Right, so Eventbrite, you can choose how to handle that in Eventbrite. We choose to do it bi-monthly. So uh, every two weeks, we'll, they'll dump it into our bank account. Um, you can choose to do it monthly, or you can choose to do it when your event is over. Uh, so those are your three options. Um, for us, we do it bi-monthly, uh, just to not have a whole a lot of money sitting in one place, it, it helps as we work through the event that we're hosting. Facebook will do it when their event is over. So say um, Brian is doing a birthday fundraiser for us and it lasts for a month. So we won't see that money until the end of that month or the month after. So say it goes for his birthday fundraiser goes February 20th to March 20th. They'll dump that first, the end of February into our bank account and then they'll wait until the next month when that is complete. The other ones, like you said, Square that we've used previously um, will be immediate. PayPal, um, another thing I recommend is always carrying around, you know, a little a device that you can take donations whenever you're, um, say, at a coffee or something. And, hey, how do I give to your org? You know what? I got my PayPal uh, device right here, and we can connect on my phone, and you can make a donation right here. But PayPal will dump it um, overnight, too. It, it, you can you can change those settings and see what you what you prefer and what you like. That's a very good question because you know, for instance, with Facebook, if you're doing a major campaign and and really hoping to um, to get some some income in quickly before an event, for instance, you'll know the total giving amount, but it might take then up to a month to actually be deposited in your, your account for cash flow purposes. So it's definitely good to make sure that you're checking into that with all of your, your uh, services. Um, another example there is for us, our donor database, Bloomerang, that we use, that one I believe is also nightly that it's deposited. Um, so the, the quicker the better uh, for everybody for cash flow, but definitely make note of that. Uh, great. Are there any other questions? Please feel free to uh, jump in on the chat or the Q&A. We'd love to answer any other questions you might have. Um, I know that... Oh, here we go. There's a, a, a great note from Julie from Yankton Area Arts Council that came in. Um, 
she's recommending that one thing to consider as an option is to have a separate account where online monies come in and then move it to the main account you use um, just because then if there's any issue with delaying the processing, if someone gets access um, to your account, like let's say they somehow get your Square password, then not all of those funds are in one place, which is an interesting idea um, uh, to consider. Um, oh yes, and then um, Ashley from Brookings is reminding me that with PayPal, it's um, you have to go into PayPal to request them to send the funds to you. And then it takes about one business day. So with PayPal, it's not automated, but within about one to two days, you can have access to that funding. And I wanted to say a quick thank you to a, a number of the community arts councils um, that were able to join us on a, on a Zoom network call last week. Uh, we were able to really expand a lot of the ideas for this session and a lot of the specific services and, and examples that people use based on their experience. And so uh, we're really, really thankful to have such experienced and um, um, experienced organizations and people that are willing to share all of their knowledge in the state. Well, please, uh, we'll, we'll stay on for a couple more minutes. If, if anyone else has questions that pop up, um, please know that we'll have this session archived. We'd love to hear from you anytime. If there are any questions you have, any uh, professional development sessions you'd like to see, we'd love to, to hear your ideas and expand what we're working on. Uh, my email is on the, the site. Uh, Sherry and Jim are both just Sherry and Jim respectively at artsouthdakota.org. So please feel free to reach out to us at any time with questions or ideas. Um, also make sure you're on our email list, uh, especially during these times, we're really highlighting virtual events and a lot of um, COVID-19 relief fund information. So as soon as we hear from the, uh, the State Arts Council about any of the updates to their grants, as soon as we hear about additional NEA funding coming through, um, the unemployment for independent contractors, that will all be published on our email list and on our webpage. So please uh, uh, take a look there. And we really appreciate everything that all of you are doing to help keep South Dakota creative and moving forward in these really difficult times. Uh, so thank you all so much for joining us and we're wishing you all a great rest of your day and the end of the week to come. Thank you all. Thank you.